welcome to VM End to End, a show where we have a VM skeptic and a VM enthusiast try and hash out our VM still amazing and awesome. Uh, so, Brian, thanks for coming in today. I appreciate you. Happy to be here. Let's get to it. Yes, yes. Last time we talked about uh, our cloud VMs relevant. You know, are VMs still relevant in a cloud native future? You said definitively yes. So today I want to go a little bit deeper and, and find out what exactly is a cloud VM. Can you help me out? Absolutely. Let's get into it. And, you know, first it's, it's a virtual machine. You know, like uh, I think m most of what people know about virtual machines is all true for cloud VMs. And the, the thing I hope we get out of, out of this today is that there's a bunch of extra stuff you might not know about or might not think to look into. Okay. So let's, all right. It's like a cloud V it's like a regular VM, but not. So a regular VM, we said it's a, it's a machine on a computer. You said a cloud VM is a little bit different. What are the specific differences with the, the real parts, the physical parts? Yeah. In the end, it's all running on real computers somewhere, right? So, you know, when the VM is up and running, you've got a real CPU, you've got real memory. Um, and I think the, the parts that are the most fluid are probably the disk and the network. Um, and, you know, in Google Cloud, those are both software-defined uh, services that give you a lot of flexibility. So I think the, the takeaway here is instead of thinking about it as a slice of one computer, think about it as like the slice of a data center's worth of computers. Wow. All right. So that's an interesting thought to me. And, and what I'm curious about is if I have a slice of a data center, how is that manageable or usable? Like if I wanted <laughs> to make a video game, what do I do with a slice of a data center? I think that's a, a great example. So it's down to you know, what are you trying to do? And we then take, you know, a bunch of the variables that are possible and kind of group them up. So we group them up into compute optimized, memory optimized, accelerator optimized, and then general purpose. So the, the compute ones are for, you know, where you need the lowest latency single threaded computation possible. Memory is where you need the maximum memory you can possibly stuff in a, in a machine. You know, you're running like an in-memory database or something. Um, and the accelerator ones are for when you need a GPU or, you know, one of our tensor processing units. And then for everything else, general purpose. General purpose. Just like most people just need a, a laptop. Like, so, okay. You have these specific uh, groupings, maybe families of, of machines ordered. Within those families, can I, can I specialize? Like if I need a high-end gaming laptop versus just like a low-end gaming laptop. Absolutely. Um, and you know, the first knob you have is just how big it is, you know, so how many CPUs and memory. So you can have like a two core machine or a 20 or a mm. 460, you know, core <laughs> machine, you know. Um, and so they get, really? they get bigger and small. Yeah, really. Uh, and, and, you know, up to 12 terabytes of memory right now. And like those numbers keep getting bigger over time. So depend, you know, when you see this, it might be different. Um, and, you know, by default, those come in kind of like, a preset ratio. So they kind of grow together. Um, but the, you know, kind of part of the main reason people wanted to use containers at all is that not everything fits in that exact shape. So you end up kind of orphaning some of the capacity and you know, kind of wasting money. So we also allow you with the general purpose machines to pick um, your own ratio. So if you're like, oh, I know this is a really CPU heavy thing, but I don't need that much memory. You can make a computer that's that shape. And you only pay for what you actually need. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, so these, like if you can make your own shape, somewhere there has to be physical memory. Yep. Uh, so where do we get this in a cloud VM? Yep. So when you turn, when you go to set one of these up, you know, we find one of the machines out there that has space for the shape you want and start it up there. Mm. And so that's, you know, this um, kind of a Tetris problem becomes not your problem. And we're big enough that there's almost always a good spot for that to fit. Yeah. And so these are all on one machine. It just sounded like there. Oh, so, you know, there's a data center worth of machines. And so like when you go to start yours up, you know, we find the right spot for it, you know, find a computer that has Got open it. space. So tell me a little bit more about disk then in this, in this yeah. slice of a data center world. So if we can just turn it on, on like any one of these computers in a data center, right? Like how do the disks work? Um, where's my data? Um, and so mm -hmm. we, by default, our disks are almost always network attached storage. And so instead of a, a physical disk plugged into one computer, I mean, those still exist, but we provide a virtual disk made up of hundreds or thousands of disks plugged into a whole bunch of computers um, and then assemble, you know, the blocks together virtually, um, which gives you um, 
you actually get higher performance than you might get normally. So like the the throughput is very fast. And then you get a right. bunch of the features that you might expect from like a SAN, like a storage area network. So you're gonna you can attach and detach on the fly. You can Yep. Okay, that's really cool. So you can okay. do that, you can uh, resize it, um, and like you use the snapshots to take backups. But the resize thing is kind of amazing. Like if you run out of disk space, you can actually make the disk bigger while the computer's running. Ryan, you're blowing my mind right now. I gotta, I gotta act skeptical. I'm gonna be skeptical. <laughs> you're blowing my mind. Um, something I'm curious about when I, when I'm using containers, I can select an operating system. Um, and so what, what the benefit of that is I can write applications to operating systems that I know and love. I can only use what I need. Um, is there that same concept in the VM world or am I stuck? Like what am I forced to use certain types of operating systems to use a cloud VM? Yeah, very similar concept. Um, you know, with, you know, whereas in a container, it's mostly just the files that make up that, that system, you know, kind of mm -hmm. per, per runtime. Whereas here we have the whole operating system running. Um, but other than that, it's, it's really pretty much the same concept. You know, you have um, most workloads these days are running on Linux or Windows. And so we provide mm -hmm. kind of pre-made images of Debian, CentOS, CoreOS, Ubuntu, Red Hat, Enterprise, SUSE, um, and Windows Server Data Center, a bunch of different versions. Um, so when you create a VM, you say, okay, I want it to run this OS and, and it makes a copy of that image, you know, kind of on the fly and boots your machine mm -hmm. off of that. Okay. That's really cool. Um, are you, can you use your own at all? Yeah. So if you, uh, two ways to do it. So one, if you want to use one of these OSs and just kind of put your flavor on it, add some tools, configure it the way you want it to be, you can boot off of one of them and then make a new image based off of the work you did. Nice. So that that's a really common thing. And then if you if you want to, it's a block device. And so, you know, you can, you know, make a customized version of an OS or, you know, develop a whole new OS. And as long as that runs in a virtual machine, you can boot off of it and go. I got to be honest, it sounded like there's a lot of flexibility. There, they're like all these things, I'm like, well, in containers, you can do this. And you're like, yes, you can do this yes. in VMworld too. Well, and a lot of it's based on oh. that. So like, this is a, you know, kind of a, you know, high level version of what a cloud VM is. You can basically mm -hmm. run anything that runs on a computer. Um, okay. So I, all right. We just specified really quick. There's some virtual parts or some physical parts. Uh, your disks are going to be spread out over the uh, over a wide data center, pulled together to give you more reliability, uh, more consistency. A lot of times you said it's even faster throughput. This is like really cool. What I'm curious about is uh, what are like actual like things that are non-obvious extensions of this. So like, what can I do with this? Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I think one of the, you know, like underused or kind of underknown things is actually running a container, like a kind of one one container per VM as a pattern. Yeah, why would I why would I do that? So a couple of different reasons. Like one, containers have become kind of a distribution format. So a lot of software yeah. is already, you know, ready to go uh, in a container. Um, and sometimes you know you don't want to deal with kind of setting up a whole cluster or managing some other stuff. You just want to run one thing. So that's that's a reason to do it. And then sometimes there's, you know, constraints. Like that particular thing, it might make sense to run it on a very large machine for a short amount of time. Or, you know, it, it needs, you know, some particular, like, uh, configuration that you might not have otherwise. Right. So it, it may make sense to kind of run. of containers. Yeah, one-to-one. -one. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what, all right, but I, I mean, in theory, I could still run containers for a lot of this. Yep. What are <laughs> what are some other features of cloud VMs that, you, that you're excited about? Yeah. So um, one I think is um, it's really commonly used in almost all architectures. You know, pretty much everybody has a load balancer when you have multiple machines, right? And mm. the, the non-obvious like cool thing is that yes, we have a load balancer, but it's a load balancer service that is provided at the data center level. It's not, you know, some particular computer that has a certain capacity that as soon as you hit, like things start slowing down or getting, you know, overdrawn. So you're actually configuring the data center level load balancer that Google uses for like YouTube and Gmail to run your own machines. That's so I uh, one that's just really cool thinking about that concept. But what I'm blown away right now is thinking in uh, Kubernetes. Uh, I use services all the time. Yep. 
And this and GKE, this uh, the load balancer that's provided is the cloud load balancer, the Google one. So even then, I'm using the Google Cloud load balancer. Yep. Um, my question though is like, I can still access this load balancer. It sounds like it's configured already for me through something like Kubernetes. Um, is there a reason to go lower? Is there a reason to go to to this level? So if you're already using Kubernetes, you know, use Kubernetes. But I think um, mm -hmm. you know, it's the, those patterns are super useful. And you know, not all software you know is set up to run in containers, or is so easy to do there. So if you want to use that those same pattern patterns, of having a single endpoint that you can communicate with, yeah. So this this Got idea okay. of having a a known endpoint that you know provides this service, and then there's a a group of you know containers usually in in Kubernetes, but a group of computers in this case that you know do that. And once you do that, you have um, a known endpoint and a group of computers, and we call that mm -hmm. group in compute engine, a managed instance group, um, then you can put a bunch of logic on that. So it's actually a service in and of itself. So it handles starting up new machines when they're needed. If you turn the dial up and you're like, oh, I have five now and I want to have 10, it starts the new ones. Um, that can be set up to be run mm -hmm. automatically, you know, depending on the load you get. And then you can spread those out across the world. You can, you know, have some of them running in one country, some of them running somewhere else and route the traffic to the closest one for your users that sort of thing. I'm going to have to find out more about this. Like I'm, I'm going to have to dig in deeper because like, I want to be skeptical and I'm like, this all sounds amazing. Um, in a further, like, I think like, I don't want this conversation to go too long, but I'm definitely going to want to dig in deeper here. Um, in fact, maybe, maybe we can have an episode. This, would you count this as a like admin infrastructure, networking, what is, yeah, what is I this? Yeah, I think, I think we should about? dive into the networking a, a bit more next, right? And kind of how that actually works. And, you know, when I say it's not running on one box, how do, wait, what? How do you, how do you distribute yeah. traffic if it's not going through one machine? So let's do networking. And then I'm just, you know, I love the disks and there's a lot more to talk about there. Let's do that. What else do you want to hear about? This for sure. I want to hear about cost. Uh, I'm going to have to do some of my own homework after hearing about like machine families and uh, all of this. I, I need to go start and create a VM. And I hope people listening at home do the same thing. Yes. Because I'm, I'm going to be more skeptical next episode. Okay. I'm, I'm going deeper. But this episode, I, I got to admit, cloud VMs sound pretty cool. They are. Give it a try. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. And I, I'll catch up with you next time. See you soon. Bye.